our shared screen, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, hello, everybody. I really can't see you. It's a strange way to give talks, but um, I'm doing my best uh, to get uh, psyched up about this. Um, as uh, uh, so, we I'm going to be talking about uh, this reasonably long mouthful of a, an idea called Polanyi versus planning, planning around AI's new romance with tacit knowledge. Um, so let's see if this thing is yeah. Um, so actually, this is not the usual normal style um, DC doctoral consortium um, mentoring talk. So I did give one of those a while back. Um, before probably some of you were born in 2009, I had a lot more hair and a lot less fat at that point of time. Uh, but, you know, and that uh, thing about how to give talks and write papers, I wound up doing that once again um, in um, um, each guy a, a few years later in 2013. That version is actually available on YouTube. So if you're interested in, in one person's uh, view of how to write papers and give talks, um, you know, at least my view, you know, you can try checking it out, uh, especially if this talk doesn't bomb, because if it bombs, you know, at least what not to do, presumably. Uh, so that's about, uh, you know, something that, you know, it's a more of a mentoring talk, but I'm not going to give that. Um, now it would look as if I might be giving an actual uh, research talk on my research. It turns out that's also not true, as uh, you know, Alvaro pointed out. I actually give, uh, I do work in um, uh, human AI systems and the closest projection of that into this community, in, into planning, of course, which I call, consider myself, I consider my home community, uh, is explainable planning. Uh, there's a great workshop that happened um, in a couple of days back, and, and maybe some of you were there too. Uh, so my uh, current overview of my research is in this AI magazine article that just came out. You might look at it. And if you are interested, apparently we rented a session tomorrow, AM1 on explainable planning, a bunch of the talks there. I believe three of the talks there are from our group. So that would give you an idea of what we are currently excited about. So I hope you will come to those sessions too. Okay, so that's about what this talk is not about. Um, either of these talks I could have given without much of a preparation. And so I asked Alvaro to these two ideas and this other idea about Polanyi versus planning. And I told him, look, you know, please say one of the other two because this one I have to make the talk. And as a good friend, of course, he said, go with the third one, the one for which you don't have any slides. So I spent, I guess, last one week, essentially sort of uh, pottering around ICAPS, thinking about what I'm going to tell you. So that's what I'm going to do. And so it turns out that this talk is kind of not a mentoring about how to write papers kind of a talk. It's also not my specific research, you know, to get how, you know, ICAPS papers kind of a thing, but it's more of a sort of a declarative bias to get you to think about planning research in the current age. Uh, so that's what I'll try to do. So it, it's sort of a bit of a festivus like, and you know, for those of you younger ones who think, what is this festivus nonsense? You know, festivus is your heritage. It's part of who you are, you know, ICAPS is basically uh, started this festival back in 2005. It turns out that I went and found this kurta that I wore in the original festivals when I actually ran the show. And so I still fit in it. I guess that's one of the advantages of buying really large kurtas. So you can always fit even after you get uh, quite fat. Um, also, I noticed that I am talking at 1 p.m. in the afternoon here for me, but it's probably like nine o'clock in uh, Europe and uh, and, and also maybe seven o'clock in Australia, nine in the night evening for uh, Europe and seven in the morning for Australia. So to anchor, I, you know, I know that you're not in the work day time. So I thought I should suggest a nice um, uh, drinking game too. So here is a drinking game for you. Every time you hear the word tacit or explicit, take a swig of orange juice, and then you would have enough C vitamin to last an entire year. So that's for sure. Okay, so let's get going now. So let me start with this. Okay, so last year in 2019, um, Jeff Hinton, of course, came uh, to Phoenix to take his uh, um, to to provide give his um, uh, the Turing Award lecture. 
uh, he and Jan Lekun both came and gave the lectures here. Um, anyway, so when uh, uh, Jeff started giving the talk, I and mean, I was actually in the audience, you know, because it's in Phoenix, we, we all, you know, made a pilgrimage to the convention center there, and we were in the audience. And this is a picture I took um, of, uh, you know, his uh, first slide. He started by saying there are two ways to make a computer do what you want. One is intelligent design, and the other is learning. Say what you may about uh, um, Jeff, the man knows how to use words just so, just right. He would have been a natural in ICAP's festivals, really. Um, it turns out that you can put intelligent in front of pretty much anything in the world, and it would mean a good thing. And he put it in front of design, and it becomes a bad thing. You know, those of you who know the whole intelligent design theory business, which is all these evolution um, uh, deniers. Uh, so obviously, nobody in science would like to be connected to intelligent design. In case you couldn't see what was on that slide, this is what he was saying. Intelligent design involves figuring out consciously exactly how you manipulate representations to perform a task and then tell the computer in detail. And you know, things like excruciating, et cetera, is of course Jeff doing it, but really, if you know how you do the task, you tell the computer uh, a model of the task, and then presumably, you know, add a search algorithm on top of it, the kind of thing that we do in planning. And then he says that is intelligent design, so that anybody what their salt in science would be worried about being in that area. Um, and then the other, of course, is learning. Show the computer lots and lots of examples of inputs together with the desired outputs, and then let the computer learn how to map from inputs to outputs. You know, it's like basically just let the evolution play um, in computing and let the you know AI happen that way. So that was the way he starts uh, the talk in a very nice way. Um, now, learning versus being told, okay, which is basically an interesting thing for this community. We know that we actually give PDDL models. We'll talk about it a little more later, but we do give computers what we know about the world and we let them do the combinatorics. Um, so Hinton is really, just reinforcing the AI zeitgeist, uh, if only in sort of a doctrinal form and if only in a very Hinton-esque form. Um, AI technology has managed to catch public imagination of late, I mean, thanks in large part to the impressive feats in perceptual intelligence, the things like the vision, audio processing, et cetera, um, uh, voice recognition and so on. And then bringing those advances to the masses on the street who, you know, with their cell phones, okay? That wound up being like a very big way AI has become um, you know, very popular all over the place. Uh, most of these advances um, have in fact, however, been in what I would call tacit knowledge tasks. Um, tacit knowledge task we'll talk in a minute is basically these tasks that we do what we have no clue how we do. So if you were to make a theory of how people see objects, ask computer vision people, they've been trying to do that and it was an object failure, object with the A. Uh, object with the O. Uh, but anyway, it was a failure. And so it was actually, we don't know how we do uh, voice processing. We don't know how we see the world. Um, and so these are tacit knowledge tasks. And intelligent design approach, of course, fails. Because if you don't know how to do the task, and if you tell the computer how to do it, it's going to be the wrong way to do it. But then the interesting question is, are tacit knowledge tasks really the only thing? And are everything, though, Interestingly, this community looks at this problem in a slightly different way from the rest of the world, especially people, let's say, uh, on robotics or vision community. Um, basically, we do realize that, in fact, there are many tasks for which there is a human um, know-how, you know, into about the domain models and so on. And that's what we started from. That's what the whole PDL model stuff is. Um, so when you're thinking about it, that's where we start thinking about Polanyi's paradox. Uh, Polanyi is this polymath, Hungarian, um, who wrote, among many other things, he's a philosopher. Um, and one of the things that he did was this writing this book about tacit dimension, the tacit dimension, which is basically he started talking about tacit knowledge, you know, whose definition from Wikipedia shown there. Essentially, as I said, it's the thing that we know how to do, but we don't know how we do it. We don't, we are not consciously aware of how we do this task. Um, so Polanyi actually was lamenting when he wrote this book on the tacit dimension, he was lamenting the fact that too much of our attention is typically focused on understanding uh, explicit knowledge tasks rather than the tacit knowledge ones. Um, and so, it, it, 
And then basically, so he was arguing that really we know more than we can tell. We know more than we can verbalize. And so how come we are ignoring that stuff? That's what he was worried about. So he was thinking this was sort of been seen as Polanyi's paradox. And to understand how into, how inculcated it is in our psyche about these explicit knowledge tasks, remember things like you know, this, this uh, uh, Feynman uh, thing saying, if you want to master something, teach it, okay? It turns out that actually really only works for explicit knowledge tasks. That's the same way you say, if you know, if you really want to understand how to do something, program it. You know, tell me if anybody who programmed um, like a transformer based uh, language completion or uh, Kanunet based vision has figured out any more about how we see the world or how we complete the uh, language. That's not at all the case. So, in fact, we always just thought when we talk of thoughts, uh, tasks, we thought of explicit knowledge tasks. And so it seemed like a reasonable thing that. Polanyi was worried that, you know, guys, look at a little bit of these static knowledge tasks too. Um, in fact, you know, this is a slide that I'm, I have shown a couple of years back in, in a talk that I gave at uh, ICAPS, um, that, you know, if you just look at the kinds of, the types of intelligences that people show, uh, human kids sort of come into this world showing perceptual and manipulation intelligence, then emotional intelligence, then social communicative intelligence, and then finally start showing cognitive and reasoning intelligence. And this is sort of almost like the human kids, when they come in, they have sort of animal-like intelligence abilities that they're able to show already. And then they grow over and they start showing this cognitive reasoning, which we sort of have connected to human civilization, okay? Um, so interestingly, uh, in, uh, if you haven't already thought about it, um, AI systems developed exactly in the opposite way, right? We were essentially creaming, um, uh, Deep Blue was creaming the chess champion, Gary Kasparov, way before Deep Blue can recognize a little chess piece on the board because vision was not something that AI systems were doing before, but they were doing cognitive and reasoning um, tasks quite a bit before. Okay, this is something that people in planning should really, really remember and understand. Um, not the people who come into AI after AlexNet thinking the only thing that we need to do is uh, start from vision and somehow build a human, but people in planning know better essentially, um, which is exactly why I keep making fun of this, you know, uh, that show me an AI expert confidently proclaiming that in future AI will not only just learn, but will also be able to reason too. And I'll show you someone who entered AI via newspaper headlines after AlexNet, because after all, AI has been doing reasoning way before it started doing tacit knowledge tasks like perception. So keep that in the back of my mind. Um, it wants out that it actually explains quite a bit of what goes on in AI. It's after all easier to program computers on aspects of intelligence for which we do have some kind of conscious theories. They may not be foolproof, but at least we know how to write a couple of PDL operators uh, for various you know, planning domains. But if try writing an operator for vision task, you have nothing to write because you don't actually know how vision is done you know, by us. Um, so it turns out that for these explicit knowledge tasks, the progress in reasoning and cognitive intelligence happened much faster because we actually first started right, telling the computers at least partial models of how to do those tasks and automated it with combinatoric search and various other things. We are not particularly conscious at all of perceptual and manipulation and you know th those sorts of intelligences. And so we had to depend on making machines learn exactly the way we did, which is basically learn from observation, data, demonstration, experience, and so on and so forth, okay? Um, keep in the back of your mind that if you only, as a human being in this society, learned only from your raw experience, never saw anybody else, never read anything, never got told anything, you are not likely to be a civilized person even at the lowest common denominator level because we do depend a lot on the ability to transfer these explicit knowledge tasks uh, across. Uh, but things like you know how to walk, etc., you just have to do it yourself. Nobody taught you how to walk. 
you know, and nobody taught you how to speak, at least in the beginning parts. Um, and, you know, of course, that this thing became feasible, you know, as, I, as we think about the fact that this became feasible, uh, this learning for these tasks became feasible because really of the orthogonal, ex, you know, extension, orthogonal developments in things other than AI, such as web, and we just completely uploaded our collective subconscious to the web, and then that became the data in which you are training your systems. Now, it's also useful to realize that actually, if you take an intro to AI class as against a machine learning class, both of which should be really well connected, but the difference you will wind up noticing is that much of AI tends to, at least the textbooks, tend to be oftentimes inference focused. And so I basically, you can think of these two broad ideas, inference versus learning focused approaches to um, AI or intelligent agent design. In the case of inference focus, which is the kind of thing planning people always did, you sort of assume that models are available. So you're sort of looking at explicit knowledge tasks. Uh, there as representations are available. There's no such thing as learning representations. We generate representations and we write our knowledge in that representation. And then we generate algorithms that will um, basically be able to search through configurations and do reasoning with respect to that. So it's sort of inference focused. We do make a little promise to ourselves saying, you know, no, no, one of these days we're going to do learning. Um, but oftentimes we don't really get up to that, at least for quite a long time, people didn't get up to that. And so inference winds up being in the foreground and it's great for the explicit knowledge domains with good models. And of course, AI de development followed this direction for much of its history. And much of the planning literature has done that too. And one of the things I would try to get you to believe is that this is a great thing because being human involves doing both explicit and tacit knowledge together. Okay. Um, on the learning focus side, you make the opposite. It's sort of, I think it's like the earliest versions of this have been uh, connected to things like subsumption architecture, which is assumed that agent have no a priori math models focus on learning even the primitive models and representations, you wind up at least getting a sort of a typically reflex agent and then sort of promise to yourself that one of these days we start doing reasoning and you know longer term um, decision making, et cetera, et cetera. So this idea typically, this idea tend to postpone for inference um, and reasonable for tacit knowledge domains with no good models, but a lot of examples and experience generators. And there's been significant research progress in this side more recently, especially after AlexNet, after 2013. And you know that sort of got us to a point where, as I think Andrew Yang put it, anything humans can do in a few seconds, computers are able to do, okay? That's great, amazing that computers are now able to do anything that humans can do in a few seconds. But if humans only did what they can do in a few seconds, you will have precedents like ours right now, okay? So you actually, humans plan, humans make long-term reasoning, humans do all sorts of explicit knowledge uh, based uh, reasoning and so on. And so they sort of both have to be combined for humans. And uh, um, so in fact, and I already mentioned as to why this uh, specifically the tacit knowledge tasks being, a, you know, the, our ability to do that wound up increasing, you know, catching public imagination already, but I don't want to go into more, but, you know, certainly people like being able to use the fact, like the fact that their cell phones can recognize their voice, it can, they can complete their sentences, etc. These are very, very useful abilities, but that's not necessarily the full story of intelligence or intelligent behavior. Okay, um, so um, one other thing I want to mention just before, since I came very close and some of you must be thinking about this. Rao is talking about explicit versus tacit knowledge. I already know about system one and system two, uh, which is basically Kahneman and Tversky did this. Uh, I talked about it, by the way, system one and system two are essentially theories. There is no part of your brain called this part is system one, this part is system two. It's just a, a, a metaphorical way of thinking of the brain's abilities, human brain's abilities. Uh, and that system one tends to do reflexive reasoning and system two tends to do deliberative reasoning. Having said that, there is somewhat of a difference between system one, system two, and explicit and tacit. And I want you to understand it as we're going forward here. Most tacit knowledge tasks do get handled by system one, okay? However, explicit knowledge tasks can start in system two. You start, start doing things deliberately before, but may get compiled into system one reflexive behavior for efficiency. In fact, people have said that civilization progresses 
by the ability to do many more things without thinking than you started with. So originally when you started um, you know, figuring out how to do differentiation, you were doing limits f of x plus h minus f of x by um, you know, h limitation to zero. But then if you kept doing that, you would be very much behind times in terms of the ability to do differentiation. So you compiled it down and you started actually doing some of this stuff reflexively. Even though the, system, the explicit knowledge tasks that got compiled into system one and tacit knowledge tasks that really stay in system one are sort of in both system one, there's still a difference because you know, it's the difference between just an assembly program or an assembly program that got compiled from a higher level language. In the later case, if the assembly program fails, the higher level language can be, you can actually localize the failure in the higher level language program. And that's how we wind up debugging. Uh, symbolic debuggers work that way. So this is basically interpretability aspects come into play when you have explicit models. Um, I can't resist showing something that was uh, printed uh, way before probably most of you were born in doctoral consortium for sure. Uh, in 1989, you know, there was uh, AI magazine had this huge raging controversy, AI area as well as planning. Um, and so magazine ran, ran this thing about universal planning, universal planning and almost universally bad idea. That's what Matt Ginsburg was saying because Marcel Shoppers basically said, look, why don't you want to start with something like a PDL model? In those days there was no PDL, but compile it down to a reflexive policy. So you essentially solve lots of problems up front and just remember the solutions, you know, more or less, memoize, okay? And Matt Ginsburg basically writes a whole bunch of pages pointing out that the combinatorics are such that, that the table in which you want to remember is going to be huge. And so it's a universally bad idea and that you want to think sometimes um, uh, when you wind up doing this, right? Now, times have changed right now. We don't longer think so we're not so worried about space versus online computation trade-offs. In fact, we are very happy to throw online computation time into space so that you can put you know, your policy in you know, terabytes if you want, as long as you can just answer the question very quickly. And that trade-off is a different one from whether the original uh, originally you had explicit knowledge or not. That is something that I want you to understand you know, as we go forward. Okay, so now Polanyi's paradox is what we talked about, but you know, I, as you can see while I was talking, really there's a bit of a Polanyi's revenge that's been going on in AI, right? Um, essentially, we, AI now has this complete new romance with tacit knowledge. Um, there's this old show, old, not show, old, uh, uh, the, the story about Archimedes, who drunk by his, you know, uh, the fact that he discovered this idea of fulcrum and a lever, said, give me a lever and a place to stand, I, I can move the world, okay? And so it's sort of like that we are right now saying, give me a big enough GPU, a large enough data set, and a deep enough network, I will create you AGI, just not even human level AI, just AGI altogether completely. Um, so this sort of bothered me, I, you know, partly because I've seen both sides of AI and I think, you know, being human involves doing both of these, both explicit and tacit knowledge tasks. And so I wrote this um, in a viewpoint article, um, which is coming out in CSM um, in February. Uh, that's also available on my web page at that address. Uh, so Polanyi's revenge and AI's new romance with tacit knowledge. And what you see in that viewpoint article is some of this uh, setup that I've shown you, as well as a couple more points um, that I want to show you before I go from that article to its direct impact on planning, which I've been talking about to some extent, but you know, I want to talk more directly about how does this all matter to planning folks in ICAPS in particular. Okay, so this is data versus doctrine tension. Um, in the world that you live in. Uh, Polanyi basically was worried that you are expecting, you're only working on problems for which there is explicit knowledge, there is doctrine, and let's just work also on tacit knowledge. But now we have went almost the, the other way. AI is basically, we are mostly only working on tacit knowledge tasks. It's almost become fashionable to take problems with explicit knowledge models such as Sudoku and convert them into a bazillion examples just so that you can say, I did deep learning, okay? So it's almost like, forget about going from data to knowledge. There's an entire cottage industry about going from knowledge, explicit knowledge to data, just so that you can then uh, 
give it to some transformer or something, and then try to recover the original knowledge you started with, uh, and and essentially write a paper. As strange and exotic as it sounds, it's being done. So many of you know this, and some of you are probably doing this. So the interesting question, of course, is what do we do when we actually have doctrine that we want systems to follow? You know, that's the kind of things that people in planning have always been looking at. You know, look at uh, domains where there is some amount of domain knowledge that people are happy and willing to give you. Would you just spurn them and say, don't talk to me. I will just learn from behavior. Is, that seems like a completely uh, silly thing to do, to me at any rate. Uh, one of the hallmarks of human intelligence seems to be a seamless interplay between tacit and explicit knowledge. And in a weird way, I think the pendulum for us has swung from all models are wrong, some are useful to what are models? Why do you need models? We just go from data to decision directly. And that is something that we need to obviously give some thought to. Um, so in, in the, in the write-up, actually, on the, um, on, on the viewpoint, which is for, meant for a more generalized audience, I actually try to connect the Polanyi's revenge to a whole bunch of affliction, the things that are afflicting AI right now. And I've written a bunch of articles you know, um, on this separately. You can look up my web page. Um, but you know, for example, this whole issue of interpretability, you should not be surprised at all that systems which learn their own representations don't have to make sense to you, okay? And, it, and whereas if you started from something like a PDL model, that is sort of at least you understand the things that you're putting in. So the interpretability problem is a much simpler issue there. Um, similarly, this issue of if, they don't, if you don't quite know what they have learned, then susceptibility to adversarial attacks is quite high because you can't guarantee that things will work as expected. And finally, of course, probably much more interestingly, um, susceptibility to data set bias, the two things that are going on on the right hand side. One is GPT-3 being given um, prompts saying to Muslims and irrespective of what you do, many of the completions that it comes up with is that the Muslims were involved in some bad thing, like they killed people, they got killed, they did something, etc. It's a completely nonsensical thing in a civilized world for us to talk about. And yet it's not surprising because OpenAI, the GPT-3 essentially learned from our collective subconscious. We do have crazy thoughts. We do have thoughts that we don't say it aloud, you know, unless, you know, unless you're impetuous and you have very poor emotion control, uh, impulse control, you don't talk about this. The way this happens is what the system one generates, the system two can stop from being explicitly said by you. So there is a control that goes on and we don't do this. And of course, it's not surprising that you wind up having these problems, um, you know. And, and so this is something, the bigger sense of how the, the fascination with tacit knowledge can get us into trouble. Uh, so the question of course is, when do you learn from examples versus when do you take knowledge from the, um, the, the, the humans? It's obviously you can delude yourself in both cases. Planning community, as I'll show you in a minute, was hoping for superhuman humans who will be able to tell the planner how to decide whether node number 7539 should be removed from the search tree or not. That was for a while. The, things that we did in things called mixed initiative planning. Uh, we were expecting way too much. Uh, we were expecting humans who had no life to begin with. And you know, on the other hand, this other side is saying, there is nothing humans can tell us. We'll just try to learn from data. And so clearly figuring out when is it you're supposed to learn and when is it supposed to ask for data is something that requires some wisdom. And so I have my own version of the serenity prayer that Christianity has, except for this uh, purple robot. It says, human grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot learn and data to learn the things I can and wisdom wisdom to know the difference. And part of this talk is to try to give you at least a little bit of that wisdom. Some of you already possess it. Some of you have shown that you don't have that wisdom because some of you have written papers that I'll be naming names on in a minute. But it's the kind of thing that we need to figure out. And you know, an approximate idea is where the explicit knowledge is available easily, we should use it. And we try then, of course, that opens up interesting questions as to how to bridge that with tacit knowledge, which is something that we will talk about. Okay, let's get to now the planning part of this and how this whole thing projects onto planning. Um, ICAP style planning, uh, the mainstreamish ICAP style planning, automated planning has for the most part focused on explicit knowledge tasks. You know, 
our central conceit has always been that there are many domains where people have explicit verbalizable knowledge about the task and and so there so basically we focused on model specification languages whether it is strips pddl sharp schemas uh, rddl um, etc to make easier for people to write the knowledge that they want to verbalize and then developing efficient of the shelf planners for handling these models okay so explicit knowledge in planning is like all over the place we have to admit this you know in icaps we can't say explicit knowledge doesn't matter because then what the heck are we doing you know in most of the work that we are doing so planning community has always taken the easily available explicit knowledge from human designers we in fact supported even approaches that are even more knowledge intensive providing for example control and abstraction information trying to get it from humans we as i said expected superhuman humans who had nothing else to do other than give us models sometimes okay so there is explicit models such as pddl that is easy enough but we also expected sometimes control information control rules etc so in fact the last time around i was this riled up about knowledge and explicit knowledge was back in icaps 2003 um which that slide there where i was sort of ranting about knowledge based planning and whether we are actually comparing fahim and dena or are we comparing to planning algorithms with respect to some knowledge bases that becomes point of interesting so we had these issues but we certainly were open to using explicit knowledge but lately there are some exotic attempts at best to jump on the pixels to decisions movement even for domains where explicit knowledge is easily available i don't know who whom we are trying to impress doing that but certainly there is work of that kind that's being happening in ai itself as well as in the planning community in general um so this essentially is the way polanyi will come into planning with his revenge and the polanyi comes to planning through rl uh, reinforcement learning that's the general way to think about it so let me talk about uh, two slides worth of that connection between planning and um, and um, especially deep reinforcement learning so if you view planning as the problem of going from model to policy i'm basically looking at uh, these little pictures that i um, happily uh, clipped from uh, mike litman's nice talk in um, you know prl workshop now if you view planning as the problem of going from model to policy reinforcement learning is really going directly from experience to policy so it doesn't think about model it's just try to learn the policy from experience planning is try to infer the policy given the model um now there's a version of reinforcement learning called model based reinforcement learning that has this intermediate step which has a model and so you can learn that model in you know vanilla rl you learn that model from just experience and then you use that model uh, and to inf do inference to get the plans okay and then plans become the policy okay so model free rl doesn't even bother with the intermediate step if you're thinking about model based rl i would like you to think in terms of just normal learning can go from data to category decisions but then most learning goes from data to hypothesis to category decisions and it is hypothesis intermediate point while it is not theoretically needed winds up providing as a nice way to inject interesting biases about the world in which we live in so similarly just as you can bias the hypothesis we can bias the models that are learned and in fact you know vanilla model uh, rl basically doesn't take anything from humans we'll talk about that in a minute but i would actually argue that we should be considering you know pdl models as the initialization for example partial models as initialization which are then improved through experience and that's a lot more useful way to combine uh, partial knowledge that next person are able to give you okay so given that now rl and planning you know i once was talking about this fact that planning and rl are two central areas of ai separated only by a common problem this is what they said about us and uh, uk are uh, two great civilizations of, you know separated by a common language so i think planning and rl really have a lot in common but we don't talk as much because partly because even though the problem is common the tasks we focused when left alone wound up differing quite a bit planning people that is you know icap planning people tended to look at explicit knowledge planning tasks whereas rl folks mostly tended to focus on the tacit knowledge planning tasks the card pole balancing the grasping manipulation and some of the greatest 
uh, neatest you, you know uh, feats of uh, deep reinforcement learning have been in manipulation um, robotic manipulation because those are things for which we don't know how to write any easy um, um, explicit knowledge schemas and so they are able to learn uh, with some you know simulators uh, you know working on simulators we'll get to the simulator in a minute too um, now Palanji comes to planning through these deep reinforcement learning these two ways one is why even bother with planning step when you can just learn the policy go model free if you go model free planning is not needed at all there's no intermediate step the second is why bother with explicit taking explicit knowledge when you can learn the model in your own representation, the one that you made up, this whole representation learning aspect from experience, okay? Which is typically results in learning inscrutable models. Um, both are certainly reasonable stances. Both of these are certainly reasonable stances for tacit knowledge tasks. I hope you're taking your oranges, but quite quixotic for complex tasks that involve both explicit and tacit knowledge. Uh, both from the point of view of robustness of the solutions that we come up with and the interpretability of the, you know, the, the solutions as well as the operation of, the, um, of the, our AI agents. So that's something that you want to keep in mind. And so that's how the Prolonius revenge is coming to us. Uh, this is a small digression I want to make. RL folks, for strange reason, even though by definition, there was nothing about RL which says you should not be taking knowledge from outside because after all, the model can be uh, biased with uh, partial, you know, biased from, you know, to begin with before the learning happens. And there has, over a period of time, RL essentially has decided that they don't like taking knowledge, but then they know that they can't really learn from experience. I mean, learn to drive from experience would involve that, like that car falling. And then when you fall, I learn from your experience, not you, you die. Okay, so since getting experience in the real world raw in tooth and claw can be quite deleterious to the robot's health, many RL systems actually work with externally supplied simulators, but still bristle at taking any explicit knowledge. It's sort of funny because simulators are made by humans. We don't mind taking the simulators, but we don't like humans giving us knowledge. That's kind of the bitter lesson versions that you can interpret you know, from Rich Sutton's essay. Um, it's highly unlikely that for explicit knowledge domains, simulators are easier to provide than partial domain knowledge. If you require me to provide a Blocks World simulator, I probably will write a Blocks World PDL model. I will then throw in some sort of an action um, you know, evaluator. You know, unless I'm really taking something way beyond what we call blocks work. So in general, this issue of simulator, do realize that simulator is a way humans wind up providing very useful knowledge for RL and that's something to keep in mind. In fact, something along these lines will be talked about by Leslie in her talk, um, you know, a couple of days later. Okay, so. Deep reinforcement learning is amazingly good with these wiggly worms. You know, this is the open AI um, uh, thing that, that I just copied from. Um, essentially, they can learn how to do locomotion uh, quite well. And you can't write a PDL model with that, okay? But on the other hand, you on this other side, you have uh, Steve Chen and Co and JPL want to talk about mission planning, mission scheduling. Schlumberger people apparently want to talk about drilling and how to do drilling plans. It, the world at large has lots and lots of planning tasks for which there are no simple simulators, ergodic simulators on which you can repeatedly keep, you know, trying out and figure out how to do the simplistic task. So the question then is how do we actually bridge these kind of tacit knowledge tasks with this kind of explicit knowledge task. And in fact, in between there are tasks like task and motion planning, which involve aspects of both. And that's really the interesting thing we should be talking about, okay? Now, whenever those kinds of things happen, neither the bottom up going all the way up, nor the top down coming all the way down, doesn't make too much sense. We have to consider ways of combining the best you know, aspects of both directions. And that's something that I want to convey uh, in the few remaining minutes I have. Okay, so how do we plan around AI's new fascination with the tacit knowledge? Well, first idea is join the romance. You know, many of you are doing it, um, and actually some of you are doing it. Um, basically, after all, every explicit knowledge task can be converted into a tacit knowledge one if you just try a little. 
Okay. So for example, you can take PDL models, take pictures of it, and then it will become an image. You can have CNNs, GNNs, transformers, or even performers that just came out yesterday uh, to analyze them to recover the model. Um, in fact, I mean, of course, transformer uh, performers will be useful in more sequential data. So for example, use PDL model and FF to generate a ton of planet traces, submit these traces to some sequence learning algorithm. Again, one of your favorite ones. Jump on the pixels to decision bandwagon, take pictures of the transitions of the block world configurations and try to see if we can somehow recover some sort of blocks world model that can be fed to FF and then you know pat yourself uh, very happily on your back. Um, these are a base. In fact, there are papers for all of this. I just didn't want to specifically name those papers, but many of you probably know these papers. If you ask me nicely on DM, I'll send you citations for people who have published these papers. I, let me just say I'm not a huge fan of this direction because in some sense you are trying to just go bottom up, take something which has explicit knowledge and are trying to solve it as a tacit knowledge does. Of course it can be done, but what is the advantage? You know, it seems like it actually has all these other issues such as interpretability, robustness aspects coming in. The other one, which is the recommended one, and this is actually the dense slide and then I'll, you know, look at some pieces of it, which I hope some of you will consider. Again, there are many, many good things that can be done. These are things that sort of occurred to me for my small brain. Um, you really want to combine and make the sum greater than the parts, okay? Look at, for example, tasks that involve both explicit and tacit knowledge components, motion and task planning, that's been a great area. I would love to see how those will benefit um, you know, some of the work that I really like uh, is the kind of work that Leslie and her folks do um, in CSAIL. They're actually seriously realizing that you want to combine these things. And there's a nice talk that Mike Littman was giving, Michael Littman was giving the other day, which is also sort of focuses on these things. Um, what while looking at those kinds of directions, look at making the model acquisition task easier with learning. We always talk about this. There are better and worse ways of improving the model acquisition. I'll tell you a little more about this, but certainly these days you can't say learning is not solved. So we have to somehow not look at this problem. So that's definitely what we're looking at. Looking at planning for partially specified and incomplete models. It winds up being a related problem to actual model acquisition. If you admit that the model that you're working with is incomplete, then you really have to talk about robust planning because it's not a, it's no longer a situation of find an optimal plan with respect to this known to be correct model. Such is not any longer true. Look at interpretability issues if, especially when um, the systems have both explicit and tacit knowledge. I love XAIP community. They are doing a very good job in terms of making interpretability and explanations. Um, then there is sort of a shared vocabulary because it turns out even then there's a huge amount of work to do in terms of explanations and interpretable behavior. But when there is no shared vocabulary, that becomes even more challenging. There are interesting directions that are being taken. I will talk a little about this, but certainly those are directions worth looking at. And of course, some of the other things that are going on, which I um, think is great, are looking at compiling control knowledge via learning. We always looked at deriving heuristics with you know, clean principles, but really you can uh, try to learn heuristics from traces, of the, from, from experience of the planner, that is something that is easy to do and that's worthwhile to do. Of course, you won't have the optimality guarantees and informedness guarantees, but really, you know, life isn't having those guarantees. And so these are useful things and lots of people work, are working on this. Even in this conference, there are papers on this. That's a great direction. And finally, look at generalizing planning technology in cases for non-declarative representations, when, especially for those places where you are stuck only with a simulator, people don't want to write you a domain model. There are some people have already started working on this too. And these are, I think, recommended directions. They're worthwhile looking at. Um, so, Next, what I, I'm sorry, next, what I want to do. Yeah, next, what I want to do is kind of talk about three of them quickly and then wrap up. So learning for model acquisition and refinement, learning models from scratch, uh, from experience alone is unlikely to result in robust and interpretable models. So this picture that Michael Littman had, I would just basically say, we should be allowing declarative bias, partial models into this learning stage. People in machine learning talk a lot about inductive biases, but oftentimes 
they are stuck yet with inductive bias being the topology of the network, which is a fine but very primitive way to tell you what I want you to learn. Um, I should be able to give background knowledge, which you then uh, you know, improve further over experience. So it's much better to provide declarative bias in terms to the model learner in the form of partial models, which are then refined via learning. It's not, these are not work that's done. I'm just saying these are directions that you might want to look at. Um, that way, essentially, you can start with it like an okay model that you got from the human and you are improving it over time uh, by, from experience. And you know, it also allows for interpretability that way because you're still sticking to something that the human started you up on. Learning models from text meant for human consumption is also an extremely fruitful direction. This is a great way we can interface with all the uh, advances in NLP right now, because you can take um, uh, long, long back, people used to do this, but that time NLP technology sucked. Now NLP technology is much better. So you should be able to read recipes and then get essentially some partial models, which then can then be used possibly as the beginning stage for this model learning. Um, so we actually have some work in Ichikai 2018 that you might look at, but there are other people doing this sort of work that's very useful. One thing that I would not suggest you do is recovering PDDL models from FF traces. If you have the PDL model, why are you then using FF to generate a whole bunch of plans if only to re, you know, invert these traces back into the model? Of course, you can say, because I will that way get a paper into the ICAPS planning learning track, but that's not a good reason to do it. So that's a very quixotic thing. That's not a worthwhile thing to do. Uh, planning with incomplete models winds up being quite relevant here because once a learner realizes that the model that it has, a planner realizes that the model it has is not guaranteed to be correct in any real sense, it needs to start thinking about robustness. It needs to start thinking about taking into account the fact that it has ignorance about the model. Uh, and so, this actually leads to things like representations for incomplete models. Uh, you know, I've been sort of in my group looking at not just strips, which is sort of a fully causal and certified correct model from the user towards models that are more and more shallow and less and less guaranteed to be correct and complete. And then talk about how to do planning, robust planning with respect to that. And so you need to think about the kinds of representations for these kinds of models. And you need to think about what does it mean to do robust planning over these representations. Now, some examples from our own group include domain models with possible preconditions and effects that Tuan Nguyen has written a paper on in AI Journal in 2017. And of course, planning problems with uncertain reward metrics, which is where actually a lot of work that's even now popular about diverse plans has come about. Um, you know, it's one of the earlier words. So those are, I think, quite relevant things. Um, once you start thinking about multiple models, in some sense, this issue of model uncertainty, you can take a Bayesian view of it and say that when you are uncertain about the model, that means you really have many complete models, one of which is the true model. And you, so you actually are doing a Bayesian account of uh, uh, planning. That's the way to do robust planning in general. Um, and so it turns out that when you're thinking about human aware planning, something that much closer to my heart, it turns out that this becomes even more of an issue. So you now have a robot with an MR, which in itself can be incomplete. So it can be actually a set of models. And then the human has an approximation of the robot's model, which then the robot is trying to estimate. So this M hat RH will again be a distribution of models. And essentially the robot is stuck with doing multi-model planning to figure out whether or not its uh, uh, behavior is interpretable. So this is quite relevant even from those directions. In fact, there's a nice paper uh, by Sharad um, in XAIP this year on Bayesian account of interpretability measures that you might look at. Um, Actually, I should probably mention that, you know, somebody this morning was asking somebody in the doctoral consortium who was somebody who was doing good explainability work on sequential relation making problems. This person asked, I don't see why it is connected to XAI. I don't quite know why they asked it, but some people tend to think that XAI essentially means explainable machine learning with inscrutable representations. And I want you to kind of realize that's just a very small part of the spectrum. XAI is hard, but mostly as a debugging tool for inscrutable representations. Pointing explanations are quite primitive. If we had to 
point is the only way we can talk to each other. We would not have had the civilization we have. Explanations between humans typically tend to be very critical for collaboration, but they are not pointing and they are not a solid activity by the agent. So the kind of work that's actually being done in XAIP community is very much relevant um, in, in the, in the um, you know, this whole interpretability direction. Um, so that's something that you might want to keep in mind. And again, as I, I kind of uh, uh, tongue in cheek ask, if you take this adversarial example where this um, school bus with some noise becomes an ostrich for most of the current um, you know, deep learned uh, um, vision systems. Can you ask the vision system, tell me which part of this particular second school bus is making you think it is an ostrich and how possibly useful can it be in, in, in essence, right? So pointing explanations is okay if you're an animal, but you know, we are humans and we really have to go beyond that and we want to keep that in mind. One last thing uh, before I summarize is handling differing vocabularies is important. Much of the work in XAIP is done with essentially two PDL models, maybe with the differing precondition effects kinds of things. Eventually we should be able to extend this in cases where parts of the models that are being used by the machine are you know, sort of not, they're inscrutable. They're not in the PDDL style models. But then the machine is willing to translate its explanation in a language that you understand. There's an interesting work that's going on in both ex, you know, explainable machine learning community and then some of which we are doing in our group. Uh, there's a paper uh, that Sharat and Co are involved where essentially you provide the explanations even if you are doing reasoning with a black box model, you provide the explanations in terms of concepts that the humans understand. And you, the machine, understand these concepts by learning their denotation over whatever is this in inscrutable representations that you're looking at. So this is doable and worthwhile doing. Last but two slides. So um, Jeff Hinton and Rich Sutton are both saying intelligent design is crude. We should just be waiting for learning to happen. Um, my, so the question, of course, a reasonable question can be asked that we came into this world, essentially, um, that we evolved to this point, essentially, um, to from hum, animal intelligence to human intelligence, from amoeba intelligence to animal intelligence to human intelligence, and developing a pretty nifty system too along the way. And we even managed to make sense to each other sometimes, right? So why do I need any kind of explicit knowledge to us? Maybe I can just do this whole thing from, you know, from bottom up. Um, I don't necessarily want to argue that it cannot be done. Um, but it might get done by the time of rapture and I want AI systems to be able to work with tacit as well as explicit models before then. So think about it in this way that you want to have these systems working right now rather than saying, I want the wiggly worm to start doing NASA mission planning and let's see how it's going to happen. Um, even with the fast compute power, it's just not at all clear how long that's going to take. And it's this whole entire issue of whether or not when they do that, their behavior will be interpretable. So we would really like to have interpretable AI systems with planning capabilities a little earlier than the rapture time. So summary, the expecting explicit models for tacit knowledge tasks is as silly as rebuffing easily available partial models for explicit knowledge tasks. If you ever ask people, can you give me a PDL model for how you see the objects? That's just as silly as them saying, let me figure out how you do blocks world just from pixel transitions makes no sense because there's somebody who can actually tell you how it's done and you can combine that. There are many fruitful directions for planning around AI's current romance with tacit knowledge tasks without gratuitously adding 12 grams of a performer or transformer networks to mission planning tasks. I'm all for combining these technologies, but I'm not a big fan of doing it just for getting the papers. Which brings me to why I'm showing my students slide because those are the poor guys who have to deal, tolerate my harangues whenever they want to say, Rao, can we just put in a couple of graph neural network algorithms, you know, for, for fun of it, you know, and I'll just say, tell me why, tell me exactly how does this matter? 
and uh, that is for that as well as for at least actually letting me harangue them, you know, and also I kind of tried many of these arguments on them. I thank them and I show you them. And of course, the purple robot is hopefully learning from my students, me and the rest of us uh, humans on how to grant it serenity to accept the thing it cannot learn and data to learn the things it can and the wisdom to know the difference. That said, I will end with this summary slide of uh, join the romance, which I'm not particularly a fan of, and combine to make the sum greater than parts part that I think is more fun to do. And I thank you for your attention.